Hi, this is Don Dizon. I'm a professor of medicine and professor of surgery at Brown University. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm also the founder and director of the Oncology Sexual Health First Responders Clinic at Rhode Island Hospital in the Providence, Rhode Island. And I was asked to talk about fertility and sexuality for young women with breast cancer. And I think before I go into this topic, it's really important we understand one very main point that conversations related to fertility and conversations related to sexuality represent separate and distinct domains for people with cancer. So I would very much um, want you to be cognizant that when you're talking about fertility with people with cancer, especially our younger population, that is not the same thing as talking about the, uh, uh, the sequela of treatments on sexuality. But both are important. Why is discussing fertility important? It's shown in this slide. It's, you know, it, if you just look at the statistics in the United States alone, about 25,000 women are diagnosed under the age of 45 with breast cancer each year. And we know from very long standing historical research at this point, the risks of infertility cause significant distress in women of childbearing potential. That's WOCBP. Up to 75% of young adults, in fact, who were treated for cancer expressed the desire to have kids when treatment completes. It is a major cause of regret after cancer if one is not approached uh, and one remembers being approached about fertility prior to treatment starting. And this is one of the reasons why major societies, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the European Society for Medical Oncology call for the routine discussion with referral uh, for young people who are being diagnosed with cancer and are going to be undergoing treatment for malignancy. Even with that said, the statistics are startling. Almost 40% of women of childbearing potential are not referred and as much do not remember having these discussions. And it's even worse for our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer patients who um, in a very recent uh, um, survey of these cancer survivors, over 80% have no recollection of having discussed fertility with their, with their team. But it is a really important issue to try to bring up early. Fertility concerns do exist after cancer, especially among people who are getting chemotherapy. This is a very recent case control study where each person with cancer was matched to 10 controls who um, had no cancer and as such did not receive chemotherapy. The main findings here are reflected in the anti-Millarian hormone level, which is often seen as a marker of ovarian health. And uh, the higher the levels, the more healthy the ovaries. If one did not receive chemotherapy, or if someone had a no history of cancer, the fall in the AMH levels is linear. And this goes out to five years in this controlled study. If you got chemotherapy, your AMH levels are, are falling or behaving, but not in a linear way. There is this rapid decline followed by some leveling off for about two years and then another fall. Notice, that the levels are never as high um, while someone is on treatment as those who never got chemotherapy, indicating ovarian toxicity from chemotherapy, not restricted to cyclophosphamide and the alkylating agents, but also seen among people treated with platinum salts. This is another really um, recent um, study that looked at in a case control fashion among people who underwent diagnosis and treatment for cancer under the age of 40 and then control uh, and then compare them to peers, a peer group in a almost like a two to one fashion. And what you're seeing here is cancer survivors versus those without cancer and the number of live births that were recorded. And I think as you can see from these hazard ratios, it's lower indicating that um, among people treated for cancer at a young age and compared to the control group, 
there is a significant reduction in the chances of a live birth after cancer. And it's quite significant, except for perhaps people treated for thyroid or skin cancers. If you look specifically at the population who had breast cancer, the hazard ratio is 0.44, and it meets statistical significance because the uh, upper boundary, the confidence interval, does not cross 1.0. But if you just look at the numbers of live births, you're talking 140 to over 800 among the control group. So these chances of having a live birth were significantly lower after the treatment for breast cancer. Now, again, multiple reasons may be in place, none of which are really controlled for in this clinical trial. But the big picture is fertility is affected by cancer treatments, especially chemotherapy. And our patients face a lower risk of a successful pregnancy going towards a live birth. These are all really important issues that um, stress the, uh, the urgency to discuss fertility before treatment starts, because there are options now to approach fertility in our patients. Prior to cancer treatments, we can discuss modifications of treatment plans, if at all possible, staying away from cyclophosphamide if it's, if it's an option, maybe using lowered doses, if at all possible. Um, you know, if someone is going to get radiation therapy to the pelvis, which is not common, clearly in breast cancer, there are procedures where the ovaries can be moved outside of the radiation field. Perhaps one of the bigger um, um, things that we've learned in the treatment for breast cancer is that you should be using these gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs, GnRH analogs, prior and then during chemotherapy to help preserve ovarian function. And then we talk about those things we can do before we start treatment, oocyte or embryo preservation, and at select centers, even the option to freeze ovarian tissue. For our patients who have who were not um, counseled around fertility or circumstances around their malignancy made fertility preservation uh, not a really good option for them or those who underwent a fertility preservation procedure like IVF or oocyte collection that was not successful. It doesn't meet their dreams of having a child are over. There are things that can happen after cancer treatment. There is ovarian tissue transplantation if someone had tissue freezing performed. You can do IV in vitro fertilization with implantation. And for people who were not successful in having eggs retrieved, you can also talk about egg donation for the purposes of that IVF so they can carry their own pregnancy. For those who are unable to carry a pregnancy due to uterine factors, this is where we talk about gestational options for surrogacy. And then, of course, there is the option of adoption, which clearly in the immediate aftermath of a cancer treatment, maybe two to three years post-cancer therapy, may um, risk a, a long wait before people can have a child by adoption. So that's a synopsis of where we are with fertility and why it really is important that it be discussed. As clinicians in the oncology space, I think it's really important to understand our job is not to outline these approaches for fertility. Our job is to really discuss with our patients about what their desires are once they're done with cancer therapy. And if they express that desire to have children in the future, it is our obligation to refer them forward. So moving on, let's just talk about sexual health issues. Recognize it's a very big problem across oncology, and it's even a problem um, in cancers that are not related to the sexual organs. If you look at head and neck cancer, it's up to 60%. Colon cancer, one of the more um, studied malignancies and sexual dysfunction are up to 80%. Remember that cancer affects men and women differently. This is typically what I will show is how the public tends to think about male sexuality when they are on, when they have an erection. That's usually when intimacy is, is sought uh, because for uh, men, intimacy and intercourse are actually very well connected. 
That is not the same for women treated for cancer. I think of this um, uh, computer board, and it truly is uh, a multi-mechanistic um, uh, process. And when the computer breaks, it can, it can lead to significant confusion and distress because one cannot understand what just happened. This is the model I usually take our, our, of the people who see me and consult through. Basically, it is from Rosemary Basson, and it, and it begins with the sexual awakening in the um, asexual woman by a want of intimacy, something more in their lives, which wakes up the body to the, uh, to the sense that if stimulation occurs, then they have an increased arousal. And if arousal is um, elevated, then that's where desire comes in. And when desire is satisfied, this whole motion, this whole circle propagates. Two things, cancer can impact every single one of these arrows, either through changes in body image, changes in sensation, the loss of body parts like the breasts, and um, the systemic side effects of therapy, including hormonal therapy or non-chemotherapy treatments. Also important is that this link between desire and satisfaction does not go through a sexual activity. So we, uh, so uh, for women, intimacy and intercourse are not experienced simultaneously. Intimacy is separate from desire and it's a separate experience from satisfaction. I often will tell people that if you ever wondered why you became so much more satisfied or happier, you had this, you know, intense intimacy when your partner did the dishes for you. This model explains it in a more biological, psychological, as well as social context. There is also this issue of breast-specific sensuality. This is from Jennifer Goss's work. And what she did was a convenient sample of people who showed up in follow-up in a surgical clinic. Before surgery, 80 to 90% of people felt that their chest or their breast was a very important part of their sexuality. But after breast surgery, it falls by 10 to 10% 10 or more. Now, if you look at the context of breast specific sensuality and compare those who underwent lumpectomy, usually with radiation versus mastectomy and reconstruction, the breast or the chest wall is not a part of their sexual milieu in around the same proportion, 40%. And if you ask what is the sensation they have when the breast is touched, it is pleasurable in only 29% after mastectomy reconstruction and in a little bit over half following lumpectomy. But look at this dark blue of what is that sensation if it's unpleasant. One in five, no matter what surgery that was done, have an unpleasant sensation when their breast is touched. This is a loss of breast-specific sensuality after treatments for breast cancer. Now, it's also important to understand when I talk about sexuality as it relates to young women with breast cancer, it is not just about intercourse. It is multiple domains from intimacy and sexuality, the body image, arousal, desire, climax, and then satisfaction. It's important to sort of explore this with our patients because there are things we can do to help them. And when you think about sexuality in women, I want you to think of two different ways you can help. One is to address vaginal health, just like skin health, just like hair health. Vaginal health is something that requires attention. It requires um, a routine and a regimen for the improvement and maintenance of health. And as a side effect of vaginal health, you can have improved sexual health. So in the context of vaginal health, this is where we talk about vaginal and vulvar moisturizers. And typically I will say two things about that. One, there are multiple different types. There is a polycarbophilic moisturizer, which goes by the trade name Replens, which likely has the most evidence around it showing it does help improve vaginal health and improve sexual health. Um, you can, there is an option for vaginal laser therapy, although I do not recommend it because the side effects of that treatment can be burns and scars in the vaginal vault. 
And for women who do not respond to vaginal and vulvar moisturizers, hormonal therapies can be considered vaginal hormonal therapies because in the context of breast cancer, there's still a contraindication to the use of oral hormone therapies. For sexual health, this is where we talk about lubricants. Lubricants and moisturizers are very different things. Lubricants are to help improve sexual pleasure. There is actually a treatment using aqueous lidocaine, which is a diluted water-based lidocaine formulation. And its specific indication is for um, uh, vestibular tenderness. That is pain at the opening of the vagina with attempts at penetration. The lidocaine applied to that area with a cotton swab for about three minutes can be very effective. And that was proven in a randomized trial. For people who have pre-existing pain with thrusts, pain with penetrative um, uh, activities, oftentimes a pelvic exam is necessary to see if there's evidence of smooth walk muscle spasms or vaginismus. And if there is, this is where dilators come in. It's also important that even as women and their partners try to explore ways to improve or reclaim sexual health, that there are other things that can be done to help intimacy. And this is where there's an exercise, it's five steps, called sensate focusing can be very impactful. So just a little bit about vaginal estrogen therapy because it is a big issue. This is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology's take on it. It is not, um, it should not be used as a frontline treatment, but it is reasonable to do for people who do not respond to moisturizers because the data do not show a negative impact. There is this one study that was just published in the JNCI. It is from uh, the Danish observational cohort. And it looked at um, over 8,000 people with hormone receptor positive breast cancer in the 90s who were not treated with chemotherapy. And as you can see here, the majority of them either received tamoxifen or tamoxifen followed by an aromatase inhibitor. And the numbers of people treated with either what they called menopausal or oral hormone therapy versus vaginal estrogen therapy is actually quite low. But what they saw was in the whole cohort, and I think this is interesting, uh, if you took oral hormone therapy, there was no effect on either recurrence or mortality. And if you took vaginal estrogen therapy, there was no effect on recurrence, but there was an improvement in mortality. In fact, the 10-year absolute survival rates were better than if you took neither. Now, when you looked at it by the subgroup of people who received adjuvant endocrine therapy being a tamoxifen or an AI or AI with tamoxifen, they looked at estrogen therapy in that cohort and found that there was an increased risk of recurrence in patients who received an AI, but not in the group who received tamoxifen. I think this study requires very cautious interpretations because there was no comment on the adherence to endocrine therapy. Um, in fact, the way they defined adherence was taking the hormone uh, anti-estrogen therapy and being free of disease at four years. If you did not meet that criteria, you were, you were deemed a not adherent. They could not comment on the frequency of use of vaginal estrogen therapy. You only had to have one prescription during this time period to qualify for the study as having used vaginal estrogen therapy. And they could not comment on the formulations. More importantly is this issue right here. These results of recurrence, that there was no significant difference, stands contrary to randomized trial data, including a trial called HABITS, which showed among a very similar population, estrogen hormonal therapy, or I should say oral hormone therapy, was uh, associated with an increased risk of recurrence. So your role is to normalize sexuality as a valid concern by taking a sexual history or incorporating it into a review of systems. And then for people who have issues, your job is to refer because after cancer, everyone deserves a sex life. And that includes the young adult, the older patient, patients in relationships, those without a partner, LGBTQ patients, those with advanced or metastatic disease, 
as well as you, the oncologist. Because everyone deserves a satisfying sex life. And with that, I will close. Thank you so much for having me and enjoy your meeting.